Good afternoon, everyone. When I first ran for office, I said my three priorities were to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable. I know you've heard this many, many times before over the years, but I want to talk a little bit more about why I set these in particular and why they're still my priorities today. The way I saw it, and still do, is Vermont has had more than its fair share of challenges. We had an aging population, a workforce shortage, and declining student enrollment for decades. We've also lost major employers with the lifeblood of their communities. Those losses in workers, students, and jobs have disproportionately impacted communities outside of Chittenden County, creating a gap between Chittenden and pretty much everywhere else in the state. And yet, most of the spending decisions in Montpelier didn't take into account this regional inequity. So I ran for office and set these priorities as a way to focus on the fundamentals so we could address these challenges, attract more workers, revitalize communities that have been far left behind for far too long, and give more Vermonters the opportunities they deserve. Every proposal my team and I have put forward, every budget decision we've made, every bill I vetoed has these challenges and these goals in mind. Whenever we make a major decision, we start by asking ourselves, does this satisfy at least one of our goals? That's why we prioritize as a team, so everyone understands the choices on the table, and we make the best decisions we can for Vermonters. I believe this approach is essential to solving our challenges and make sure Vermonters get the most out of the investments we make, because it's their money, not ours. It's their money, and they've entrusted us to spend it wisely. It's especially important to remember that in years like this one, when we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars in surplus. Take this year's budget, for example. We knew it was going to be a tough year. So we started with an understanding of how much we had to work with without raising taxes and fees. Then we heard from agencies and departments about new initiatives to move us towards our goals and cover additional needs. As a team, we thought through the benefits and costs and weighed the value of proposals against one another. What we presented to the legislature was a balanced budget that grew by 3.57% without raising taxes or fees while still prioritizing housing, public safety, flood recovery, and human services. Now, as I've said, there were more asks than available funding, but we prioritized based on all the principles I talked about and made tough decisions based on our fiscal reality. I believe we owe it to Vermonters to have the courage to make these hard choices instead of asking them to pay more or increase costs that put, uh, that put on our economy uh, and their livelihoods at risk. Unfortunately, the supermajority in the legislature is talking about a different approach. Every committee, committee appears to be doing its own thing without any spending parameters in sight. They did the same thing last year, growing the budget more than what was sustainable, which added to the level of difficulty when building this year's budget. This year, they overspent in the BAA before understanding the full budget picture. So that put them in a $15 million hole before they even started working on the fiscal year 25 budget. As a result, House appropriations on an eight to four vote moved forward with the budget to make cuts to some of our shared priorities, like housing. The House budget slashes housing investments to help low-income and vulnerable Vermonters, which is bizarre. It eliminates funding for VHIP, which has probably been our most successful housing initiative, lifting people out of homelessness. These days, our housing partners are reporting costs over $450,000 per unit that take years to build. In contrast, 
The VHIP initiative brings units online in about 100 days at a tenth of the cost. Another example is healthy homes and mobile home improvement programs, which help Vermonters stay in their home, but those were cut in half as well. And our proposed expansion of the Downtown Village Tax Credit Program was eliminated altogether, which has helped smaller, more rural communities the state uh, so desperately needs to add housing. Now, when you consider this, along with the fact that neither chamber has yet to pass any reforms to make it easier and less expensive to build housing, and the House is taking up a bill, H687, which will make it harder and slower to build for most communities, it's difficult to understand how legislative leadership can still say housing is a priority. Now, I understand the House has housing investments in another bill, but to gut these programs, which have proven to have the greatest impact, just doesn't make any sense to me. What also makes little sense to me is that the other housing bill has new and higher taxes and fees with very little to actually generate units. Which brings me to my next point. They're spending a lot of money in other bills, keeping them separate from the budget, which is unusual making it less transparent, more difficult to keep track of. So we have to look at the aggregate. And to pay for all of it, they're increasing costs for those who live, work, visit, do business, and invest in Vermont. If the House is successful, it will make Vermont the highest tax corporate state in America. Not exactly a great marketing strategy when you consider the businesses we need to locate here. Not a great strategy to keep employers here who are already dealing with high costs, from property taxes to payroll taxes to utility costs and numerous other mandates, much of which put Vermont at a competitive disadvantage, disadvantage already. Making this change with the potential for huge consequences took about an hour of committee's time with virtually no testimony. And we've seen in other areas, from the pupil waiting changes in Act 127, to the clean heat standard, and raise the age, there are consequences when we don't think things through. We should be striving to make it easier to do business in Vermont. Instead, I fear the, fear the actions that drive jobs and opportunity away exist. And while we propose an exemption on the property transfer tax to jumpstart housing, the legislature is contemplating the opposite. They want to raise the property transfer tax, which is paid for by the new owner. These are just a few examples of taxes and fees on the table right now, totaling over $100 million. And as a reminder, that's on top of the over $240 million property tax heading our way. It's safe to say I'm confused with the direction the legislature is going. We hear from Vermonters every single day who are more than just concerned. Some are angry and some are just plain scared. They simply cannot take any more. They can't afford the hundreds of million dollars in new taxes the legislature is considering at this point, or even the legislature's $100 million payroll tax coming July 1. They can't afford hundreds or thousands of dollars more a year to heat their homes and businesses, and also see their electric bills increase as well. Even things like a 20% hike in DMV fees stretch budgets thin. I hear over and over from Vermonters they don't feel Montpelier is listening to them. When costs go up, people struggle. Seniors on fixed incomes have to decide between their prescriptions or heating their homes. Parents have to decide whether their kids can go to summer camp, play sports, or take up a musical instrument. We're asking way too much of Vermonters, and they deserve better. 
and they've had enough. I'd now like to introduce everyone to Amanda Shangrock, a small business owner from Williamstown. She knows firsthand how hard it can be to grow a business in Vermont. Last week, she wrote to a group of lawmakers and shared her story. She copied Secretary Curley on it, who sent it to me. It's a powerful example, and it's one legislators should really, really listen to. So I invited her here to talk about it today because the things we do in this building have a real impact on everyday Vermonters. So with that, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. My name is Amanda Marie Shangra. I'm a third generation Vermonter who was born with severe dyslexia and ADHD. I was raised by a single widowed mom, Nancy Griffin. My father, Barry, passed away when I was young from a brain aneurysm. I grew up in poverty in rural East Callis, Vermont. My mom took a job and worked overtime every week until she could retire from the United States Postal Service. She supported a family of three of us children by herself. I went to U32 Middle and High School and then continued my education at Johnson State College. My entire life, I wanted to do good. I had dreams of a little kid owning my own business and becoming something, making something of myself. I struggled so hard in school that my own teacher advisor warned my mother my freshman year in high school that the likelihood of me even getting a diploma was very, very slim, and let alone being a contributing person in society. But I took summer school and my mom worked overtime so that she could pay for private tutors to come to our home and teach me or in Gillingham so I could eventually grow up and learn how to read and write. I did that every summer, every year, until I could graduate high school. <clears throat> in fact, when I applied for college and financial aid, my mother had worked so much overtime that our family, even though she was a single mom, made just enough, too much money to qualify for any student aid. So I had to take out my education in private loans, which I now burn, like I carry that burden and I happily pay them. In the middle of COVID-19, I met my now husband, Peter Shankra. Um, he's standing with us here. Um, Peter is a single dad who has raised two incredible children on his own. Um, Peter is a multi-generational Vermonter as well. He was raised by his mother Kay and his father Dennis Shangra. He's one of four boys that grew up in rural Williamstown, Vermont. Peter's father was a truck driver and he is known in our community as someone who had the ability to work 80 to 100 hours a week. Peter's mother Kay was a dedicated nurse until she retired just last year. Bear with me. Peter and I, by completely act complete accident in the middle of the pandemic, started a now nearly million dollar business. It's called Bergam on Amore, and we're located on Route 14 in Williamstown. We hand make luxury leather goods and we ship them all over the world. We started our business out of Peter's garage with no professional tools. We actually used a roofing hammer and whatever we could find to make these. We cut our leather with scissors. And eventually, we outgrew that space. In 2023, we found two abandoned properties on Route 14 in Williamstown, and we made the jump. We were not ready to purchase these buildings, but it was the last building in downtown Williamstown, and everyone keeps saying, do better, help your towns, lift people up. Peter and I worked seven days a week for the last three and a half years. We work 16-hour work days. We have kids who are growing up. We have sacrificed every day off. We have not taken a family vacation. We pay for the buildings in our town and the continuous upkeep with our own paychecks that we often skip. With the goal of reviving a small rural town and promoting tourism, 
We have people coming in every weekend that want to be in Vermont. Where do I go? Where do I shop? They're so excited to be here. We believe that Williamstown has and deserves the ability to build a better reputation for itself and survive post-pandemic, and that's what we're trying to do. The taxes that our business is seeing monthly to the state, bi-weekly in payroll, built into every transaction we take. On top of increasing property taxes and the endless permitting and fees to upgrade our building to meet current state code and fire code and make sure that it's safe for people to come is bankrupting our small business. Since our business started in 2022, nearly two years ago, we have paid $141,915.73 in taxes to the state of Vermont. That number is about to increase drastically. That's a price tag that Peter and I's take home salaries combined over the last few years have never met. We employ eight incredibly smart, motivated Vermonters some of which started with us as kids, making three times what I did at their age, starting out in the workforce with zero previous job experience and who are considered still dependents of their family. I'm here today because I voted for a large majority of those of you in office and I'm feeling really let down and I'm hurting and I'm feeling really defeated just like thousands of other Vermonters and small business owners, Democrats, Republicans, progressives alike, I want you to see me and know who I am. And when you go to vote for these bills, picture my face and the hundreds of others just like me. I'm asking you, our state government, as a representation of all of the working middle class, how do we survive when we don't have pockets as deep as the big corporations? How do we continue to build back better and keep our communities alive and thriving and helping people without having to accept a high interest rate loan or borrow money beyond our means or learn how to write a grant because we're already working crazy hours just to keep the lights on? We can't afford to hire additional help when we need it. We work nonstop to sustain between the costs of living currently and constantly increasing and having us to skip our own paychecks to make sure that the power stays on and we are keeping our employees employed. We feel like we're drowning. I'm reaching out because not only do we need help but I'm hoping this isn't the first time that you're hearing from a small business owner, and I hope that this helps explain how your small hikes in taxes are truly killing the working class American dream. I was told messages as a little kid that you wanna grow up, you go to school, you do the right thing, you learn even if you're different from everyone else and you learn differently, you get through it, you persevere, go away to college, but when you're done, come home, start your family here, start a business here, help the businesses here. That's what we're doing. It feels further and further and further out of reach every day. I stand with thousands of rural Vermonters and entrepreneurs when I say this. We don't wanna sit at home. We don't want to collect from a system. We want to contribute to it. We want to work. We want to create jobs. We want to create housing. We want to be a part of the, the solution, not the problem. But we are all learning daily by our leaders right now that in the state of Vermont, it is easier to give up and to stop fighting small businesses all around us. In the state are folding, they're leaving. Every one of our peers that owns a business that we talk to regularly and bounce ideas off of, considers on a daily basis if they should move their business outside of Vermont. 
close the doors, go back to their house and work in the garage. It was easier then, but it's not helping our economy. The taxes are killing us. Please, I'm asking all of you, when you go to vote on these things, these little hidden things, remember that they have great impacts and they are, they're suffocating us. That's all. Thank you. As powerful as the letter was when I read it, uh, hearing it in her own voice is that much more powerful and is real. And this is replicated across the state. And this is what we hear. This is what I hear. And that's what motivates me to push back against all the taxes and fees that I see being contemplated. We simply can't afford it. So with that, open up to questions. Can I get an email of that speech? <laughs> sure. Please send it to me. Can you talk a minute about how this proposals, specifically that are under consideration right now, like flow to your business, um, or you two is yeah. your household income? Um, well, we, Peter and I, make uh, very little ourselves. Our business expenses are quite high um, to keep people employed and make sure that they're surviving and being able to sustain their own households. Um, money is tight. The current bills that are in consideration and or have just passed are increasing our payroll taxes, which are already very high. Um, we'll see property taxes increase. The buildings that we purchase need extensive rehab in order for them to be livable. We have current tenants that we adopted when we bought these buildings that would be dispersed, one of which is a mom of five. These ripples are incredibly detrimental to our small business and our community. I'd imagine some of these these taxes that we're, we're talking about today, um, you know, the DMV fees um, and, and others, you know, we, we, these are going towards an expansion excuse me, of uh, Medicaid um, for affordable health care, uh, for, um, you know, an expansion of the criminal justice system, the judiciary. I guess, how do you square, you know, what you're hearing from voters and what they're asking from, from you and the services for, for you to provide versus how lawmakers are interpreting that, that message? Yeah, well, we'll take the judiciary, public safety, for instance. Um, what they want is to feel safe. They want accountability. They don't want the, to see the catch and release that they've been seeing over the last few years. And what we're seeing in the courts is a system uh, where people don't show up for court dates. So all this time is booked. State's attorneys show up, lawyers show up, judge shows up. The perpetrator doesn't. The one charged does not. That time is just eaten up, evaporates. And so it, it, it combines to a system that is inefficient. Um, so that wastes a lot of time. So with the budget that is being proposed by the judiciary, it adds a lot of positions. Of, I think it's 70-something positions. And I'm not sure that that's going to be the immediate answer. I think the immediate answer is get people into court, and hold them accountable. But there's other, I mean, there's other instances as well. I just, we should be, we should be laser focused on this $240 million tax bill, property tax bill that's coming our way. And from what I've heard, I'm, I'm not seeing us doing anything about it this year. I've heard some talk about maybe next year. But then it level sets. It are, it, it's a 20, 25% increase. And then you start from there. So next year, it'll be easier probably to keep it in line because you've already taken the big hit. And that's what I'm seeing. I mean, this is all this is combining to something we can't afford as a state. 
and it's all relative. And there's a huge ripple effect across the state when any of these tax proposals impact us. From, you know, they have to pass it on to somebody else. Nobody likes to hear that, but businesses aren't going to be able to absorb it. Peter and Amanda aren't going to be able to absorb it. They gotta pass it on to their customers. So it's gotta come from somewhere. And uh, that just raises the, the cost of, of living in Vermont, raises, it creates inflation. We have, to, we have to make some tough decisions, and I know it's difficult, but nobody said this was gonna be easy. But we have to live through the, the good times and the bad. And when there's bad times, we have to pull up our bootstraps and survive for a better day. And, uh, and I think, we, you know, before last year, I think we were poised to do that. But the spending that we saw last year, an increase, 13% increase in the budget, that has an effect on today because it's compounded now. Right? We already have the 13% in the budget. So when they hear about the 3.57, they think, well, geez, you're just restricting us too much. We can't live within that. But they already raised it 13% last year. And compounding, if you took it all together and did the analysis, you probably come up with about, in total, between the two, take out the compounding, probably 20%. So we're, we're, we're raising about 8, eight to 10% a year. And that's a lot. So it's across the board. And, and from what I'm seeing, again, hard to keep track of. I know what they're going to say. You know, you're going to ask me the questions. You're going to say, well, geez, Governor, you know, the budget they're presenting is about equal to yours. What are you complaining about? My answer is they cut everything out of what we need in terms of housing, included a few things of their own. Now they got four or five other bills that have spending attached to them. They're gonna be, that, you have to take it in the aggregate. And I don't think they're doing that, but we'll see. I mean, we're gonna highlight that. Governor, what would be your Cuts number one, two, and three. What what would be some give you a list? Okay, what do I what do I change in this in, in their budget? I go back to our budget. Okay. That's one. Two, I go back to our budget. Three, I go back to our budget. Okay. In in particular, which elements of that? It's hard to deter, you know all across the board again. You have to take in the aggregate. So all these other bills that are coming through are going to have an impact. Raising taxes and fees is the, my biggest concern at this point. So what can you do? So if they want to present a budget, and it's real, that grows at 3.57% across the board, let's talk. It's about prioritization. What do they want to prioritize versus what we did? If housing isn't a priority to them, say it. We'll, we'll work with them in some way to, to not raise the cost of living in Vermont any more than it is today. Again, being, being the number, number one in terms of corporate tax in America, nothing to be proud of. Governor, before you talked about a need for a balance in the building, you said that you were planning on even reaching out to maybe more fiscally uh, moderate-minded Democrats, independents, people right of center, that, that type of thing. What progress have, have, you, have you made on, on you know, recruiting and reaching out to, to candidates? Making, making progress. Can you expand it? No. <laughs> but you're, you're engaged on that front? Sure. Have, have you personally made calls? To I've talked with people. To, uh, Talk with people who have approached me about running and they're viable candidates, and they're not all Republicans. If reducing the $240 million uh, increase in property taxes is such a priority, why not update your six-year-old cost containment plan? Why not hand the legislature laws that they can just say, yes, we'll, we'll do this. Why not make it as easy as possible? <laughs> you think they'll do that? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> 
I mean, I'm going to give them, here's my suggestions to the legislature. They know them, by the way. You know them. They know them. Here's my list. What do you think? Well, for example, you've suggested lowering the excess spending threshold. We've passed laws that have pushed that out for a number of years. We've switched from a system that measures equalized pupils to a system that measures long-term weighted average daily membership. There's complicated legislative changes that have occurred that make your old proposal impossible to implement. Why not flush that out for consideration? Or we're ready, willing, and able. But they have to be willing as well. I mean, I, as I've said many times, you know, bipartisanship isn't a one-way street. But it has been in this building, it seems like, ever since I got here. I've been giving. I've been reaching across the aisle. I said at my, my budget address, I say to the state, I'm not asking you to cross the aisle. I'm asking you to meet me in the middle. I'm still still there and available to do that. But we have to set some parameters. We have to be realistic. And Vermonters are feeling this. I mean, if you're not hearing from them, I, I'm, I'm at a loss because we're hearing from them. You must be. The lion's share of the proposed new revenue would come from a new tax bracket on incomes over five hundred thousand dollars. How does that proposal exacerbate quality of life for the people that you're hearing from that are hurting right now? Well, it's just that the talk of increased costs anywhere. And again, to think that some of these costs won't impact anyone other than the people who are taxing. So there is a you know, there's a flight risk uh, to raising taxes on the most wealthy. I think the JFO even recognizes that. They put in a, I think, 35% or something uh, allowance for that. So, you know, when I say it, nobody believes it. The JFO said it. It's a tax flight. We're going to allow for that. It probably will come. So how much is that going to be? And. Who are the 35%? Are they the, the ones making just barely 500,000? And I would guess those who are making about 500,000 next year are gonna make 495. Um, or maybe those making 550 are gonna make 495. They'll figure it out. And, um, and those making a million, two million, whatever it is, I don't, we don't have that many. Um, they're gonna make decisions too. So what if it's what if the thirty five percent is those are of those making over a million dollars a year? That will impact us individually, all of us, because there's only so much money in the system, and if they leave, we'll feel it, but we won't feel it until next year. So, you know, I'm going back to what I said. In, since day one, you know, I'm, I'm just, I can't accept raising taxes and fees. And I know it's tough, but at the same time, we have to do it in our own individual lives, in our own households, in their own business. And we have to do it as a legislature, as the executive branch working together to make sure that we're not pricing people out of Vermont and forcing them to make decisions down a path they don't want to go. They want to be viable. They want to take care of themselves. We're pushing them into poverty. Governor, it's fair to say at this point these, these three major tax bills, the Medicaid, Dr. Dinosaur, the judicial system, and the housing bills, would you veto them if they make it to your basketball? We'll see what they look like. And I'm not Going to, I, but I, I've said I'm not in favor of raising tax and fees. I think we can do without it. Got a few folks on the phone, so we'll start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. I was wondering, Governor, also about the, um, the wages and if you were talking about you could meet the legislators in the middle somewhere. Is that something on, on um, 
you could meet them on the middle on on the higher you know separate out the, the high income wagers from some of the other tax increase you're talking about yeah. Not to give away your, your strategy at all. Yeah, Tim, I, I just don't know. I mean, you, you must be hearing from your members. The business community must be concerned about what they're seeing, unless I've, I'm only hearing from a few dozen of them. Um, but maybe you're hearing something different. Are they concerned? Uh, most of the concern, frankly, is on the, on the property tax side that, that we're hearing from. Well, I'm concerned about both. Thank you, Governor. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Governor, can I ask you to elaborate a little more on H uh, 687 as to the effect that it will have on uh, the rural uh, communities of smaller uh, Villages and towns. Yeah, well, it doesn't, uh, you know, it'll provide in time. Uh, there will be more expansion of Act 250 uh, throughout the state. Uh, and we'll be giving uh, tax or, uh, Act 250 exemptions uh, to, to, other, to some communities. But I, I think it's only maybe a couple dozen uh, other communities. The rest will be impacted. But I might ask. Um, who's on? Is Julie on today? No. Ed, we'll get you exactly um, some of the, the concerns we have with that bill. It's, it is in tears. Um, and it, you know, it, from my standpoint, we have immediate needs now for more housing. And this, that bill does nothing to help in that regard. It may be something that we want to do in a long-term strategy, longer term, the next, you know, four to six years. And that's okay if that's where we want to end up. But we need relief right now to get more housing built because this is a crisis that we have. And if we have, as I've said before, if this is truly a housing crisis, then we better act like it is. And we're going to have to do some things that are uncomfortable for some in order to accomplish that. And that may be some of the regulatory reforms we're talking about, like is in some of them are in, I'd like to see it go further, but in S311. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good bill. Um, it could be better, but it's a good bill and would provide some of that. Maybe they'll, maybe they will endorse that and move forward. Maybe there's a way to do both. But from my standpoint, the immediate need is housing. And I don't see the other bill accomplishing anything in the short term, except making it more complicated. Uh, uh, that's uh, perfect if you could send me some more information at the other side. Thank you very much. Ed, is uh, anybody up in Newport concerned about taxes, higher taxes? I think everybody in Newport is concerned about higher taxes. There's no question about it. Um, passing school budgets was not fun for a lot of people up here because they don't know what tax is going to have on their taxes until the legislature um, gets everything set up for the end of the year. I think that's a major concern that they're voting on a budget. They don't know what the dollars are. Uh, that might be something to consider in the future. If there's a way that you can get a better number to people in December to January when they're building budgets instead of May when they pass their budgets in March. I don't know how you can do it, but that's what we elect you guys for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thank you, Jason. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Okay, uh, Governor, um, one of the latest revisions of 687 pushes out the date to start considering these municipalities out to January 2027, um, which 
on the surface is basically saying uh, we don't see any urgency for housing if we're willing to go that long and spend that much money to create a new environmental review board. Did they provide to you or your office or staff any justification for taking the can that far down the road in the middle of the housing crisis? Um, not that I recall, Tom, but I can, I can check with um, Julie and others who have been on the front lines, but not that I am aware of. Do you feel that there's enough of a pushback that's happening in the legislature that that bill may come back to be more bipartisan? We can hope. I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, a lot of things can happen in this building uh, during the last month or two of a session. So um, I'm hopeful, but I'm not. Fair enough. I'm not betting on it. Thank you. No other question. Back to the room, Governor. You mentioned you've been in the political minority most of, in fact, all of your time as governor. Forever. This right. this conversation kind of has a different feel to it. Uh, you know, we've heard. At least, I've heard at least a couple of Republican lawmakers that are choosing to step back because of, of some of the um, issues that you're raising. Where do you draw the line as to whether to run, whether to continue? Like, where, where, where personally, where do you draw the line? Well, I, you know, I, I love my state, and I think we have so much to offer. There's so much opportunity here. If we play our cards right, if we follow through on some of the th promises we've made, I, I get frustrated when I see a new legislative session and there's always the shiny new objects that come along and they forget about the ones they started two years ago or four years ago they don't follow through and they instead uh, find this new shiny object that takes all their attention away and uh, and i i just think you know going back to the fundamentals uh, trying to to give Vermonters what they what they need, uh, but they at the same time being re realistic about our economy and and the the impact we have on everyday Vermonters. So I, this give great credit uh, to Vermont Public. Uh, read there was a, a story that I read this morning about uh, Juanita Nunn, I believe, in Callis, and uh, heartbreaking. To read the story, well done, but heartbreaking. Here's a woman lost her husband. Uh, this home has been in the family for since the 1800s, I believe, and now she's had to buy a mobile home, put it out in the back of where the home is, the home she's lived in for three decades, and uh, because it's less expensive to heat. Uh, less expensive to maintain. She can't maintain. She loves her home, but can't maintain it. So she's going to move into the, this mobile home uh, and um, dismantle this piece by piece, this beautiful old farmhouse that's out in Callis, because she can't afford the taxes. She's on a fixed income. She can't afford to live there in the in the same house she's been living in for three decades. So heartbreaking story, but. My first reaction to that was, I was thinking when I was reading, I said, we, we gotta go out there and help her. We gotta help Juanita. We, we need to fix her home. And then I thought, that doesn't fix the problem. She's, we can fix the home so she could stay there, but she can't afford the heat and, and she can't afford the taxes. We're not fixing that. Those are the fundamentals I keep talking about. So until we fix the structure, it's hard to know what to do next. Um, because it's really the fundamentals. Those are the issues that we have to face. But my hat's off to Vermont Public for talking about some of these stories. The stories of Amanda and Peter, that's another powerful story. Juanita Nunn, powerful story. We need to hear more of those. Should we be doing more to help Juanita? Well, we have programs available. And, and maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe now that we know, maybe there is something we can do. I don't know. I, I, first, I've heard of Juanita Hill, uh, none, I mean, and, um, but we'll, we'll be reaching out. There's some talk in the House about getting at the issue of the property tax increase by eliminating the ex 
exemption on the sales tax for software as a service. Um, is that a trade off you're willing to consider? Again, raising funds to offset this doesn't fix the problem. We have a structural problem in our, in our education system in general. It costs too much for what they're getting. So until we fix that, why are we throwing more money at it? Why aren't we figuring out what we can do to fix the structure? Like that, that's just a poor business decision as far as I'm concerned. So you've hired a new Secretary of Education with experience in closing schools. You talked about that last week, uh, the carrot and stick approach. Uh, is that something you see your agency of education being active in and sort of pushing the idea of closing small schools? Well, I, I mean, it's part of, part of what we have to, I've always said, that's not the complete strategy. What I've said is that's gotta be on the table amongst many other things. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be on the table in order to work our way out of the hole we find ourselves in. But as I said, I think it was maybe my first state of the state, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And we keep digging and we keep filling, backfilling with cash. That's not fixing the problem. So we've got to get realistic about what it is. And, and then we should start with the, with the kids, the students, and work our way back out from there. What's best for them? What are some of the other structural changes that would reduce educational spending? Again, we have we've provided a number of those thoughts over time, and some of them are still valid. Some of them has been pointed out, probably or not. But we've got to figure this out. I mean, we we can't continue um, to have this inefficient system that is not helping our kids. And it's just, and it's actually hurting everyday Vermonters with the higher property taxes. And to switch it to something else, just to, to switch it to an income tax or whatever, doesn't fix the problem. It goes back to, and we can do all that. If, you know, once we fix the structure or simultaneously fixing the structure while we, while we fix the inefficiencies within the system, sure. But, but just throwing more money at it, we've proven that hasn't worked. Can you talk through the timeline of your appointment of Zoe Saunders? So it's my understanding that in November, the State Board of Education sent you a list of three names as it was required by law. That was before she took her job in Broward County, where it was reported she primarily led a school closure initiative. Did you know at the time when you received her name that she had taken a job in Broward County, or was there some sort of arrangement where she was only going to take that job on for a short period of time? No, we, we just received the names from the state board. Um, that's the way it works. We didn't have any involvement in, in that decision. And then they forward the names with their resumes. And then we interviewed from there. And so had you talked to her before she took that job? Like, we, there were many, many levels of engagement with the candidates, um, and, um, and mine came at the end with all candidates. So I can't say that I, I don't know what they asked or what they knew, um, but, um, but these have been going on for a while, multiple levels, different people within our administration. We want to get a full breadth of you know, who, who these people are and what are their capabilities and who's the right person at the right time for this position, this important position. And it wasn't a concern that a candidate took a new job in the middle of interviewing for this job? No, I, I, I wouldn't think that anyone would uh, be precluded from, from being considered. Um, they have to live too. So taking another job, I think their, her goal was to, to get this job. But to take another job in between, I think, you know, I think we all have to do the math and think there might be a, at least a 30% chance, 60% chance, maybe she wasn't going to get the job. Just don't know, with three candidates. So I don't, I don't, I don't see that that's relative. Governor, back to you. Um, 
to H829, the, the housing bill with the 500K marginal tax increase, divorcing the tax increase from the policy of the bill, do you support the bill's investments in low-income housing and shelter space? Well, we've, we've done quite a bit. Um, I think in the BAA, for instance, uh, they took four million out of what we were going to use for shelters, emergency shelters, homeless shelters, and uh, gave that to VHCB. So, I mean, we, we think that's part of the answer. But we need housing throughout all different levels of income uh, in order to make this work. We just plain need more housing. So um, we provided for that as well. Um, we think that we need to, we can't do it with state funds, we just don't have them. Um, we need to make it easier for private entities to build as well. Um, and so, I, I know that you've talked a lot about the, what you see as the need for deregulation in order to encourage more building. What do you make of housing or, uh, advocates' argument that that does not necessarily help lower income folks as much as they middle or higher income? Well, I think um, whether you're setting up a homeless shelter or building a moderate income uh, two bedroom home or a condo or apartments, um, the permit process is part of the issue. It takes time to get through it. I would think the nonprofits would talk about this as well. They have difficulty getting through the permit process. So, again, if we are serious about housing, getting it put into place as soon as we possibly can, we have to do things, treat it like a crisis and do things that may be uncomfortable. And some of that is in regulatory changes, maybe just short-term regulatory changes. It doesn't have to be forever. But let's, let's get moving on clearing the path so we can get the housing that we, I thought we all agreed we needed. I think, yeah, I think opening up the payroll tax at that point in time was a mistake. I, I vetoed that, you know? Um, so I still feel that way today. I, I think, I bet there are many uh, legislators who maybe sit on different, maybe appropriations committee, that wish they had that taxing capacity today. That might help us out of a couple of jams we're in, but they already took that step. In light of this discussion, um, S18 flavored tobacco is on its way to your desk. Um, what's your read on it? I mean, would you support it at this point? I'm still contemplating that. Uh, I think I've talked about some of my concerns about about are we treating this as we do flavored alcohol and some of the other um, choices that uh, adults make? And uh, so, you know, we we have. We have uh, cannabis now that's legal, and uh, we have edibles that have cannabis in there. Isn't that a concern as well? I mean, there's, there's all these things, flavored alcohol, flavored beer. I mean, we have, we have it all, and we promote it. So I, I'm having trouble justifying why this is so much different than the others. So again, I am not a smoker. I never, never have been, never will be, um, and um, my preference would be that no one smoked. But that's not a reality, and there are adults in this uh, in this world that choose to do what they want to do. That includes other areas, whether it's alcohol, cannabis, or or uh, cigarettes and tobacco. The house is also advancing. A Maybe it's the Senate. I think it's the Senate, I'm sorry. Um, psilocybin mushrooms, um, working group exploring its therapeutic um, benefits. Uh, have, have you seen the idea? What, what do you think? I've, I've seen, um, just I haven't looked into that. Um, I thought we had passed the mushroom bill, but I, I understood that that wasn't the one that was passed. Uh, but um, <laughs> I. Uh, I just don't know enough about this one. I'll confer with our, 
our, our folks to see whether it's something that can be utilized safely uh, and uh, whether it should be. I'm sure the legislature is contemplating the same thing, though. Governor, are you still holding your weekly or bi-weekly meetings with House and Senate leaders? We have them on the calendar every week, yes. Do you go? I do. Are they? Not always, but there's there's a lot of floor time at this point. I mean, I, I get it. I mean, they're busy. Uh, there's, it's hard to carve out time to meet with me. Aren't they on Mondays, though? No, they're typically on uh, Thursdays or Fridays. Okay. Uh, but, how often would you say that these things are held? Like, that percentage? It, we schedule them every week, every how other week. Do you do all I have I haven't analyzed that. I'd have to get back to you. Get my statisticians, uh, statisticians working on that. Well, I asked because you mentioned earlier in the press conference about coming to the table and talking yeah. with legislators. I met with, uh, I think, uh, Senator Baruth last week, I think. So, yeah, we're talking. Do you think often enough? Well, until there's something to talk about, um, until there's some some reasonableness, um, I don't know what we'll talk about. Seems like there's a lot to talk about. We're, we're here every week talking to you, right? Yes, I fully recognize that. Are things friendlier, less tense? Went to that one-on-one. -on -one yeah. Engagement. No, no. We, I, you know, I try and put politics aside. I, I truly believe in respect and civility. Um, there's always things we have in common. Um, we may not agree, uh, but but that's been the way I've conducted myself over my over de two decades of political life, and it served me well, and I'll continue to do that. I'm, I'm frustrated, admittedly. Uh, with uh, some of what I'm seeing this year, but um, that doesn't mean that uh, there's animosity there with, with the leaders. And you understand their why, for why they're doing all this? Obviously, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean they're, uh, sure. I mean, it's, I think it's, a lot of it's politically motivated and they're worried about the next election and they got to shore up their base. You think that's the motivation for them, primary motivation? I think for, for the tax on high income earners and why? Well, yeah, I think they have to work there. They're not going to cut during an election year. They don't want to. I mean, they need to. They need to fulfill some of the promises they made. Governor, I talk to a lot of teachers, and they tell me, uh, you know, we really like Phil Scott. We we like him, but it seems like he doesn't support teachers or public schools or or uh, you know, the unions, and why, why do you think that is that they, they say that? Well, because you know, I'm the one that always brings up having to do something different with the system that we have, and that always goes back to them. I mean, the reality is, I think a high percentage of the cost is in, is in labor and education. So uh, some of it is in inefficient schools and so forth and so on. So it always leads to I'm attacking them, but that's not my motivation. It really is about I support our teachers. I think they do a great job um, with what they have, but we've given we don't we don't give them all the tools they need. We spend a lot of money, um, but it's not used wisely enough. So if they were if we were able to get a um, work on a system that's uh, that's uh, that satisfies some of my structural concerns. Um, I think that they would see the merit in that. We'd have better, we've had better outcomes. But it's, this isn't an attack on, on teachers or unions. I mean, I, we need them. We need more of them. They're, we're in deficit there. But this might be the time to consolidate in different areas so that we can all get what we need. Thank you all. Thank you very much.